Good morning, and welcome to worship this uh, beautiful morning after a very um, brisk night. Uh, I don't know if you were awakened last night, but we had quite a storm that moved through. I've seen some trees were snapped, and uh, we, we even had a big flower box, a big flower box thrown about 10 or 12 feet into a tree where it all kind of smashed apart and and one of our flower pots is still missing so if you see <clears throat> if you see a gray flower pot about this big rolling around your neighborhood uh, but I hope uh, everyone's well I know we lost our power a little bit too so uh, I'm glad that uh, things have moved through but we're looking forward to a beautiful afternoon so please do enjoy that uh, friends, here yesterday afternoon from 1 to 4 o'clock, there was a absolutely beautiful, loving, and creative uh, tribute to Tom Bass uh, here in the sanctuary. Uh, it was guided by uh, granddaughter uh, Emily, and uh, granddaughter Ellen sang a song that she wrote, and there were many remembrances uh, by family of life very well lived, uh, and it was an amazing, absolutely amazing reunion uh, of the uh, Barry Robinson chorus filled the steps and also of uh, chancel choir members who came back and sang an anthem. Uh, it was uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And so we want to thank the Bass family for giving us this wonderful time to celebrate Tom. As you may have noted as you came in, there are signs that are encouraging us to wear masks once again I know that's kind of where we take a deep sigh, but uh, in Dane County now, uh, COVID is a high risk once again. And while it's not mandatory, we want to, we want to encourage uh, everyone to help protect each other and the community. And so masks are going to be made available here if you choose uh, to wear them. And uh, we, have, we have friends and even a, a grandchild who recently were diagnosed. So, uh, it is still out there and it's very, very contagious. And on this uh, next Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m., we're going to have our first get going meeting of our new as yet unnamed team that's going to be creatively helping to guide us not only through the regular stewardship program for the fall, but also it's a team that's going to help us to think of creative ways to celebrate. Uh, to invigorate and to accelerate. How do you like that? Oh, come on, give me some credit for a little bit of rhyming here. <laughs> but to celebrate, invigorate, and accelerate our ministries in preparation during the fall for the coming of a new long-term pastor in the time ahead, either late 2022 or early 2023. And so you are invited, if you'd like to be a part of this new type of team, you're invited to join us, so just let me or Mark Schubeck know that you're going to join us. Seven o'clock on Wednesday. Now, friends, are there any other announcements or concerns or joys that we would like to share this morning? Not hearing any, then friends, as we are able, let's stand and join responsibly in our call to worship. Come. Join the fellowship of God's people, people who gather as faithful disciples of Christ. We seek the one who frees us from uncertainty and doubt. Come, join the welcome of God's people, people who meet together for justice and peace. We seek the one who is trustworthy, the one who gives us what is good. Come, join the celebration of God's people, people of the one who was and is and shall ever be. We raise our voices in praise and honor to God and worship the one who is faithful.
Let us pray together. Lord, it has been a difficult week. Things have happened for which we were not prepared. We have not responded to difficulties with love, but rather with impatience. We have turned our backs on others in need, placing our creature comforts first. We have been stressed, pulled, pushed, tossed. Give us peace, gracious Lord. Help us to slow down so that we can receive your healing word of love. Remind us that we stand in need of forgiveness. And then having received such love, we are to love and serve others. Teach us to pray for courage and strength. Teach us how to be good disciples for you. In Christ's name, we offer this prayer. Amen. And we open our hearts in a few moments of silent prayer. Friends, even when things seem dark, God is with us. God's love is powerful enough to overcome any darkness that we encounter. Let us remember how much love has been given for us, and let us rejoice. Please be seated. And Dave is going to share with us our first lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Tom asked me if I was going to read this in Greek or Latin. <laughs> and I said either one, but they both sound a lot like English when I say it. So, And Colossians is our scripture reading for today. The context is, in the early Christian church, this new faith in Christ had to deal with the prevalent culture much as we do today. Having emerged out of Judaism, were Christians expected to observe all rules of the Jewish law. Growing into the Greco-Roman world, what would Christians do with the customs, rituals, and celebrations of the Hellenistic world? Colossians addresses many practical issues of daily life while teaching faithfulness to belief in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 6 through 19. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philo philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the universe and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism. You were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. There are only, these are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with the growth that is from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> you mean? Thank you, Dave. I think I've heard a few hints of Greek and Latin in there. Friends, as God's people, let us take a few moments and be centered in the privilege of prayer. We thank you, holy God, for refreshing us, for awakening us to your likeness and image that you placed upon us. When our modern lives become so busy and too complex, we can easily cease to look for the beauty and meaning of eternal things around us, especially within us. We need to know ever more deeply that we are lovable because you have chosen to love us, that we are vital to human life because you've seen fit to call us by name as part of your church, your fellowship of mission, ministry, and love, and that we are useful since there never comes a time when we cannot help to heal or to guide or to teach or respond to another even if it is to show courage in the face of adversity or defeat. The Lord, if we remember who you are, when we remember that you are always near your realm surrounding us, we need never feel alone. And in the knowledge that you live with us in time and space, our fears of insecurity will vanish. Dear Lord, we do know that we live in a very real and challenging world, almost too real for us to bear, especially when we see the suffering and pain that both nature and nations inflict upon brothers and sisters. We find strength in knowing that you are not so above us, that you do not know these things. And in Jesus, you came to touch the leprous, to embrace the outcast, to accept the sinner. So how can we stand in judgment of another when you ask us whether we have never sinned? How can we stand aloof from the grieving when we remember the tears that Jesus shed for his friend Lazarus? Yes, Lord, it is a very, very real world, and you are a very real God. Lord of all, as we hear scripture today, teach us to pray for all, to pray in words truly, but also to pray in prayers of action. If we would pray for someone in need, let us pray also in deep thankfulness that you have shown us a way to help. If we would pray for intercession, let us also pray in expectation. We gather in prayer, we embrace and love all who need the embrace of your loving care and the healing of your hand. We thank you for those who have celebrated Tom Bass and for the strength of his family and community of faith. We pray for all of those who are struggling with new and or chronic or uh, emerging physical needs, emotional hurts, for those who are struggling with the issues of our times, for the people in situations of war and destruction, and for those who experience the, the fury of nature in an, a changing climate environment. Lord God, you hear all of our prayers, those that we have spoken aloud, and those that are so deeply silent within us. And we recommit ourselves to the work of Christ so that we'll feel the never-ending commitment that you have to us. For it is in this assurance that we pray now the prayer Jesus taught all who are faithful to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I know that we just shared the Lord's Prayer, but you're going to hear it again because it's in our gospel lesson, but this time it's not from the Gospel of Matthew, which is what we just repeated, which we just prayed, it's the Lord's Prayer, but this is the Luke, Gospel of Luke version. So let us listen with fresh ears. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, as John the Baptist taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus then said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked. My children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you all, Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will you give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? May God bless to us this reading from the Gospel of Luke, for it is the good news of the Lord. Sometimes the things that we see are not always what we think we see, or what we think they are, whether it's situations or, as we heard, customs or rituals. We make assumptions. Consider, for instance, there was a priest in Dublin, Ireland, Father Barry Foster, who parked his car on a rather steep slope close to the church. In the back seat was his little Cairn Terrier, so little that it couldn't be seen by anyone outside the car. So Father Foster got out of the car and turned back to lock the door with his usual parting command to the dog, stay he ordered loudly to an apparently empty car. Stay, he said again. An elderly man was watching this performance with amused interest and grinning to the father, he, he suggested, why didn't you just put on the parking brake, lad? Got it, empty car. Yeah, you got it, okay, okay, just checking. It's a long way from here out there. <laughs> Friends, a cute story, 
But it also illustrates something that we experience, I believe, in the local church, even today, a similar situation. We appear to speak to the church, and in our times, increasingly emptying churches, as if it will hear our commands and our wishes and our wants and automatically, mystically, will become something different from what we see around us. For instance, there's a lot of talk in congregations in our times, and I've heard it so often, in conversation here at Salem about renewal and revitalization, about something called faith formation, faith growth, or about dynamically serving God in a new way with new leadership, which is certainly a topic of conversation for us during a pastoral search. But the question that remains for the church is what it has always been, whether it's a church today or a church throughout history. What is it that is the heartbeat of the Christian faith? It was a great help to me. There was a book written by a theologian named James Fowler. He's a professor at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was a book that was entitled Stages of Faith. It sounds rather academic, and to be honest with you, you really have to wade through it carefully. But the book was startling in that James Fowler didn't strictly define faith as belief in a particular religious system, you know, like a particular Christian denomination or a doctrinal system. But instead, James Fowler, looking at it both from a theological and a sociological standpoint, and building on the work in moral development of, of uh, Lawrence Kohlberg at Yale, he, he came up with the observation that human nature seeks to relate to some kind of transcendent center of authority and power. So far, so good, because to us, a transcendent center of authority and power sounds like God. But James Fowler went on to point out that while it's very, very, very human to try and want and yearn to have a faith in a God, that God can become identified with almost anything, not just a religious system. For instance, as Moses comes off the mountain and he's carrying the two tablets of God with the Ten Commandments, he finds that now it's a golden calf made with human hands. The people are already worshiping. Or worship can be a worship of minor self-serving deities. We read that time and again from the prophets of Israel, Elijah and Hosea, that they demonstrated that Israel, well, Israel had chosen to marry itself to all the nature deities of the Canaanites with whom they intermingled. We have many of those glittering gods, to be honest, in our own society these days. There are even politicians and political slogans that have become almost a religion, almost a deity to the followers. And so theologians and sociologists have demonstrated that even persons who claim to be adamantly atheistic, they don't believe in God, but they can become so dogmatic about their atheistic philosophy that it becomes like, you got it, a religion. And of course, there are human addictions to, to drugs, to materialism, to lifestyle, even to destructive relationships that take on all of the characteristics of, of faith that Fowler describes. So in a sense, while James Fowler, a theologian, puts all of these tidings into provocative conclusions, stirring, startling words, he's simply observing what people make to be the God in their own lives just as the Bible has pointed out hundreds of substitute gods for God. 
Now, I know this sermon could easily take aim at the, the busyness that seems to consume our lives in modern days, you know, the work pressures and uh, parenting responsibilities, social media, ugh, sports leagues, anxiety about the present or about the future. But you know, assessing blame to such symptoms does very little to upbuild the church. As a powerful writer and social activist, a Christian Ron Sider once taught, what upbuilds the local church is for the local church to take a fresh look at its faith. It's living out of that faith and the centrality, the joy, and the transforming experience of that faith. And in sharing that, churches are renewed, reborn. I think this conflict of emphasis between making excuses and embracing renewal is what's going on with Jesus and his disciples in Luke's gospel for today. You know, we, we hear and we read these passages so often, we kind of sometimes miss the dynamics and the nuance of what's going on within them. That's why I love deep Bible study, because you kind of find out what's going on. So think about this. They are needling Jesus to teach them how to pray. Did you catch that? Like John the Baptist taught his disciples. Jesus, John taught his disciples how to pray. Can you teach us how to pray? like John did. You'll notice that after Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer, he then tells them a parable. He tells them a story about someone who gets what he wants because he's pestering his friend at midnight for bread. And so maybe Jesus is chiding his disciples for pestering him for a prayer to do what John the Baptist did to yell about sin and repentance and to point out the re religious and social hypocrisies of the day. Come on, Jesus, condemn all those substitute gods like John did. You know, John the Baptist? Instead, Jesus teaches them a simple prayer. It's a simple prayer that starts just by affirming that God, like a loving parent or guardian, will give you what you need out of love, sometimes out of tough love. God gives you what you need to put your life in balance, to receive that for which you can daily be thankful, that which reveals the kingdom of God, and in so doing renews your soul, your life, your faith, and your faith community. Let's break that prayer apart just a little bit. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. In the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew people considered God to be so holy, so other, so removed, so indifferent even, this one short sentence affirms, no, God is a caring, nurturing presence. And yet, is one so worthy of respect and deference that the name of God not, need not even be spoken to have authority. Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. It doesn't even have to be spoken. In essence, what this line simply is saying is, I feel ready to feel God's presence, to bask in God's love, to be healed by God's power, to honor life by honoring God's name that doesn't even have to be spoken. Your kingdom come. Three short words. The kingdom of God was the central theme of all of Jesus' preaching. It means when the world around me or the environment in which I live and I move and exist oppresses me, or when, when I'm afraid to utter words of faith, still I know God's realm 
is the reality beyond and beneath and permeating all the harsh realities that surround me. And I will hope in God. Your kingdom come. When I am self-satisfied with the kingdom that I have constructed, or that I've bought, or that I've taken, or that I've pushed everyone else's hurts and their oppressions, their needs outside of my concern or sight, you, God, remind me that all that I have is totally nothing in the light of what you are and what you are to me. Your kingdom come. And then give us each day our daily bread. In the wilderness of Sinai and the 40 years of wandering, God's people Israel not only depended on God for guidance, but also for daily sustenance. There wasn't meant to be excess or hoarding, but just, just enough for each day. This, this manna, this substance that came from heaven and was there on the dew frost in the morning. Because you know when there is excess, then people can't journey anymore. They have to stay in one place. They have to build structures and barns to store it all, all the success. They have to worry about the level of the excess. They have to be living in the context of, of the future. It might have shortages or worries or potential problems. Daily bread means to be empowered for daily tasks. For the calling of God in new situations, for speaking to God regularly every day, not only when it's convenient or critical. And finally, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us, or as we pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. That actually was an Aramaic idiom. And if you studied Bible study, you know Jesus spoke Aramaic, which was a variation of common Hebrew. This was an, an idiom, a saying, this indebtedness thing. And it means to let go of the recompense that we think that we're owed for slights, for hurts, for sins or wrongs against us. And there's a practical reason why, because when, when we have a tally sheet of infractions of what others have done to us, well, we can lose, we can lose sight of our slights against our own companions. And when we don't see our own faults, we can't let go of our own faults. They fester within us. They evoke elaborate excuses. They call forth the God of self-justification. And so if, if, if we can't forgive others, we can't forgive ourselves. And if we can't forgive ourselves, then how can we hardly believe that a holy God could forgive us? Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us and forgive ourselves. And do not bring us to the time of trial. We know that as lead us not into temptation, but it literally is don't bring us to the time of trial. And you know, it always sounds like, oh God, don't, don't put chocolate fudge in front of me. Or don't have alluring temptress or tempter to suddenly be in front of me. God doesn't do that. The most convincing and convicting trials actually are our own pathways, our own choices, our own responses to our own choices. When we put God out of the loop of what it is that we choose to do and to be, the time of trial is simply taking a glaringly honest look at ourselves and the choices we make. Now this line, I know you're thinking, well, there's still the power and the glory forever. 
This was probably the last line. This was the end of the prayer as Luke records it. Now Matthew dressed it up a bit liturgically, we believe. But the prayer as Luke has it, the Lord's Prayer, is so simple. It's so powerfully profound and so incredibly on target in just a few words to keep us from having substitute gods. Jesus gave a simple prayer and then he said, look, if by your very nature you know that we should care for each other like we would care for a friend, even if they pester us, or a child, don't you know that the creator of all things is going to care infinitely more about you than that? Well then, if you realize that, then focus your prayer and your life upon that, and you will then know God. There's another theologian that I've often read, Dr. Stanley Hauerbos, who spoke boldly and powerfully about a classic condition that seemed to infect the traditional mainline denominations. That's us. And he called that condition, the word he used was acedia. Now, that's not a very common word in English. So what is acedia, and what does it have to do with the church? Well, listen to some synonyms for acedia, and see if there's any degree to which this connects with what we know in the modern church. Synonyms for acedia are inaction, inertness, languor, lifelessness, paralysis, insensibility, rest, <laughs> vegetation, <laughs> stagnation, passivity, quiescence, dormancy, latency, mental inertness, <laughs> apathy, indifference, dullness, sloth, sluggishness, Passive resistance in the church, obstinacy in the church, <laughs> impassiveness, unexcitability, gutlessness, irresolution, and finally, vegetable, couch potato, lump on a log, extinct volcano. <laughs> is that, is that the church in our times? Unfortunately, that's what a lot of pe people either perceive or see when they encounter the church from outside. And so if any of those words describe Salem Church, we need to take a deep breath and take a good close look. Dr. Hauer Voss in one of the seminary lectures said this, to become a disciple is not a matter of a new or a changed self-understanding, but rather it's to become part of a different community with a different set of practices. For example, he writes, I'm sometimes confronted by people who are not Christians, who say they want to know what Christianity is about. This is a particular occupational hazard for theologians around a university, since it's assumed because we are smart, or at least have a PhD, we must really know something about Christianity. After many years of vain attempts to explain God as Trinity, I now say to those requests, well, to begin with, we have Christians taught to pray, our Father who art in heaven. I then suggest that that's a good place to begin to understand what we Christians are about. So just join me in that prayer, he says. He's saying what Jesus said. 
Dr. Hauervoss says, I believe, just reflecting simply what Jesus al already and always knew. That Christian faith is not to be explained or experienced through a lecture or a program or theology, but that Christian faith is to be experienced by focusing upon God and coming to know God in real ways in real life, in a real community of faith. You can't know God simply by observing. You've got to experience, to encounter, in order to know. I once was startled when I attended a national denominational global evangelism conference in Atlanta, Georgia. It was celebrating the vibrancy of Protestant church ministry and missions throughout the world, which is a good thing. But two things startled me there. And the first was when I realized that the demographic and vitality centers of world Christianity are far, far away from its roots in the Middle East, or its development in Europe or Scotland, or its presence in the United States. None of those are the center of world Christianity. The heartbeat, particularly of the Reformed tradition, is most strongly in Kenya, in Korea, in Brazil, in Latin America, in Southern Africa, in countries where churches are now sending missionaries out to us because they're worried about us, because we seem to have lost our zeal for Christ's mission. And what they see as former mission fields, now they feel like they have a spiritual obligation to come help us find our way back into the heart of Christ. Think about that. And we do need their help. We need their witness. We need their energy and expectation and their faith and their prayer and their love from the center of where world Christianity happens to be. And secondly, at that conference during a sermon, Something was pointed out to me that should have been obvious. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He didn't say, you know something about the light of the world, or you go to a church that represents something about the light of the world. Jesus literally said, you are the light of the world because Christ shines in and with and through your faith. And so our struggle is not to find out what we are to be. Jesus has already told us that. We are the light of the world. Our struggle is to find out how to best be it. So this is what we should pray. Lord, how can we best be the light of the world that Christ has made us to become. And so, Christians, our message, our prayer, is given to us by Jesus himself. And that is that God's realm is real and it's here. We are the hearers of that message. And so if we take Jesus Christ at his word, we must consider ourselves enlivened, alive, we must consider ourselves at risk because there's nothing that we can do or live for that means more or commits more than our Christian profession. And we must consider ourselves changed because the prayer Jesus taught us is not a prayer to ask an, an aloof God to open up the door to our pestering requests. What he taught us is a prayer to ask God to live life with us and to let us live life in with God. When we want to find ourselves on some deserted island escaping the enslavements of whatever kind, Lord, your realm surround us. In joyful times of birth, rebirth, generation, Regeneration, celebration, love. Lord, your realm surround us in the streets, in the cities, amid cries for hope and justice. Lord, 
your realm surround us. Whenever we hear the call of the revelation or the revolution of divine love brought by Jesus and handed over and trusted to us, Lord, your realm surround us. Or as we're going to sing in our closing hymn, something that will remind us this morning, our closing hymn will go like this after we've received the offering. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, you know that, and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Allelu, alleluia. Amen. Friends, let us receive offerings to do God's work and to display God's realm in the world. Let us pray in dedication. Holy God, giver of all in life that is worthy and good, we thank you that your hand of embrace and of love and understanding is always open to us. And we offer these gifts and we offer our lives as symbols that we are open to caring for the needs of our larger human family in response to all you have done for us. Receive of us all that we offer and make of us all that you can, for Christ's sake. Amen. And friends, our closing hymn has its words in the bulletin.
Friends, let us go now and let the inspiration and the perspiration of an active and loving God be seen upon all that we do for the calling and commission, the spirit and the love of Jesus Christ goes with us always and everywhere. Amen.